Father, thank you for this morning so far. Lord, thank you for the journey that you have taken us on, looking at death, forgiveness, reconciliation, and life. Father, I pray on this Easter Sunday of 2015, you'll help us further along our journey with you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, good, ooh, just about still morning, give or take three minutes. Uh, for those on who will be watching this at home, if you're not quite sure, you might see some tables over here. Uh, with some stickers on there that came from this morning, from the worship time that was uh, led by John Batham. And we were looking at forgiveness, what it means to us, uh, death, what it means to us, reconciliation and life. Just so you've got an idea, should you see the camera panning and I make reference to it later, that might make some sense to you. It's Easter Sunday! Apparently, I meant to say Happy Easter. Now, the funny thing is, a lot of you this morning said Happy Easter, and I've gone, oh yeah, Happy Easter, and it's because I don't think. I, Christmas, I do the same. New Year's, I do the same. I just seem not to think to do the, the greeting that says that sort of stuff. So, apologies if you think it's not on my mind. It is. I'm not used to the, um, I've just never done the standard greetings. Does that make sense? Because at which point do you stop? So that's all it is. Anyway, so today we're going to look at the Easter story from Luke's perspective. I didn't know, but John actually read uh, the first five verses uh, that I want us to go through. And we're going to look at it through the way that the Gospel of Luke has got it written. So you might want to turn to Luke 24. I'll be up front, though. They're probably not going to do you much good. Because we're not going to go into some great exegesis, great pulling it apart, applying it to our lives today. The application of our life today will come out hopefully in the style we're going to be doing it. So, um, so you may look at it and that's fine and try and keep up with the story. But Luke, the way he wrote the gospel and Acts is about journeying. It's, if you look at it, it's almost based on Exodus. It's all based on being the, uh, the Jews being set free from slavery, uh, from when they were slaves within Egypt. And it's that sort of thing. It's that, it's a journeying style of gospel. You with me? As you read it, you should feel the journey happening. There's silence. As you read it, which you all do, Oh, uh, we should be able to see the journey going on. And I want to read, and it's been seemed to be, for me, this Easter, the theme that's not gone away. It's something we've had around for a number of years, but it's just not gone away this Easter. And it's Luke 4, verses 18 to 19. We're in Luke 24. I'm just reading from Luke 4, just for a moment. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed are set free, and that this is the time of the Lord's favour. Jesus spoke that right at the beginning of such of his ministry uh, within um, in Luke's gospel. That's where Luke has placed this moment. And it comes from Isaiah. I'm not going to unpack it all at all. But the language for me is victory language. It's war language. It's fighting language. That's the way I view some of that. People being set free. Well, they've got to be captive in the first place, yes? So how do you release captives? You might have to go in. A bit hard and a bit strong, yeah? He has that sort of language about it. Problem was, when Jesus, when he read this out, he read this out in his own hometown. And so it fell on deaf ears. Ears that had become too familiar with him 
and too familiar with the Exodus story. They knew it. They do it every year. They recount it every year. Passover. And so, when that was being read from Isaiah, it was Messiah language, they understood it, but it still didn't understand it because it became too used to it. It just became, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus is alive. Look at your reaction. Jesus is alive. Do you see what I mean? For God came and sent his one and only son. Yeah, but, but we get used to it, don't we? Becomes part of our normal repertoire. So, if for Jesus, it's for Jesus' time it fell on deaf ears, hmm, what does Easter Sunday do for you today? Did you wake up thinking, yes, Jesus is alive. Wow, my life is brilliant. This is a good time to remember that my Jesus is alive. Do you sort of get like that? Or did you wake up and go, yes, Easter eggs. <laughs> or Sunday roast. Or, oh, I've got family coming around later and friends. Or who's going to appear at my door and the cards I've got to do. Or, or was it, oh, go off alarm, please. Let me sleep for a bit longer. You can guess which one's mine. Another eight minutes, another eight minutes. So I want us to jump to the resurrection day. I want us to look at that day, that moment, and see if we can capture something with me. And you could be somebody who doesn't know the Lord Jesus yet here this morning. And the problem is you hear it every year. Maybe you've got friends or family, and they're all saying, oh, going off to church. It's Easter Sunday. Maybe it's just a good day off of work for you. Hopefully, you might capture something of the essence, of the excitement of why Christians are meant to get excited. Note that phrase, meant to get excited, about the resurrection day. So we're going to go on a bit of a journey together. Are you with me? So it's time for your imagination. So if you wish to close your eyes... Please do. We're going back 2,000 years to what we now class as a Sunday. Let's go and see that first day. It's early in the morning. The sun is just starting up. The night is giving way to the day. Some women are walking amongst the dead, slightly chilled from the night air, slightly dazed from the three days of crying, hurt, pain and fear. But in their minds and hearts, a body needs to be properly prepared. This is the custom. This is the right thing to do. Not just anybody, but the body of a loved one, one closer than a brother, one who promised so much, yet it came to naught. But nonetheless, he deserved the right kind of burial. Honour was due him. As they approached, they had wondered how they would remove the heavy lump of stone that was blocking the entrance to the tomb. But no, the stone has been moved already. What? Quick, quick, go in. Where's the body? Where's our Lord? It's painful enough we've lost a great man, but to lose his body, why take it? Who would want it? Oh gosh, those bright clothes. Where do those two men come from? Hit the knees. Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? Good question. You can raise your eyes up now because it's going to be a real question. 
Why, and this is a real question, why do we look for life, or why do we look for a life by looking amongst that which is dead? Most of us are looking for real life, yeah? And you could be a follower of Jesus Christ. Majority of us in this room are. But why do we sometimes look for that life amongst that which is dead? Anyone want to respond to that? It's a bit of a deliberate cryptic, uh, cryptic question. Definition of dead, that that can only bring truly temporary enjoyment or what you believe is life. Things that might bring us answers to what we perceive are our problems, but actually they're only a quick fix, so they're not really alive. Is that good enough, John? Karin. I think sometimes we get consumed by the world that we live in and we get blinkered and we look away from what we should be looking at because of what is around us. Thank you. Um, I think you said it quite well when you said quick fix because um, often the dead is like easy to access, especially in our consumer -like world. It's like we want things now. And so the dead's there all around you. It kind of shoves itself in your face. And to look for real life, it takes effort. It takes um, reading your Bible. It takes et cetera, et cetera. So it's easier. Thank you. That which is dead seems to demand less of us. The trouble is it entraps us and really in the ultimate and demands more of us. Excellent, thank you. It's the, the norm. When you look around you, that's what everybody else is doing. It's easier to just... Easier to go with the flow. These three are good. <laughs> the urgent takes charge of our lives and so that what's important take second and third and fourth place because the urgent has all of our attention. Usually the urgent would fall in the category you're talking about of being dead. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll leave that as the cryptic clue. So... Verses six to eight, the two men in bright, brilliant clothing then state to our ladies, he isn't here, he's risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the son of man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. Then they remembered that he had said this. The women got it straight away. Sisters in the house, yay! You should get excited, because in a minute you're going to find the men didn't. The ladies got it straight away, a dawning moment, when the angel just said, don't you remember what he said? He's been teaching you this. He's been teaching you this. They get it. So our brave and plucky women rush back to the men to tell the amazing thing that has happened. Okay? Happens in verse 9. So they rush back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. So the women got it. Arrived at the tomb. Two men saying, what are you doing? He's ringing red. Oh, yeah. He's been telling us that. Gosh. Right. Gotta go and tell the 11 disciples. Don't forget, by this point, there's only 11 now. 
and anybody else that's there. Real question for you. What would you do when it dawns on you that something you've been taught for years is actually true? Shall I re-repeat the question? What would you do when it dawns on you that something you've been taught for years is actually true? That's a real question. Well, once I'd stopped feeling really silly, I'd uh, go and tell somebody else. Thank you, Jane. See, blunt honesty. Anybody else? I think I would spend a long time being annoyed with myself because I, I just said to Rangina, I think the reason the, the reason the women got it is because women are much more instinctive than men. Men are logical. So basically what happens is, to me, for example, is I hear a truth and I go, that's right. And then my brain talks me out of it and tells me all the reasons why it can't be right. So once I've actually settled in something, I then go... Well, that's stupid. I've wasted 15 years knowing that that's true, really, but refusing to believe it. So I'd just kick myself a lot. Thank you. And then maybe too embarrassed to then admit to it openly to other people occasionally? After a while? No, I don't really have that Okay. Anybody here have that problem? And this is where a lot of people say, <laughs> Throughout my life, I've never uh, seen anyone who died and came back. But Jesus died and he did come back, according to the Bible. But for we to believe in that, we should have faith in God. As it says in Hebrews 11, to have faith in God. Faith has been sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So that is how I know that it's possible for that to happen. Thank you, Michael. Sometimes when we realize something is actually true, as say the juxtaposition you have, you had John explaining that he would beat himself up for ages, but never knew sort of where he followed on from that. I know where John's really going to go with that, but I'm just using John as an example. And then you have Michael saying, when I know it became true, I acted upon it by jumping out in faith in the fact that I believed it to be true. So, so far we've seen the ladies in the Bible story. By the way, just want to note that in Luke, very prominent, you see that uh, uh, women who in their culture were nothing. Men were everything. <laughs> um, and I speak as a man. We're everything. Please give me a break. <sighs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, but... You know, so you need to appreciate that actually in the Luke gospel to have the ladies have such a prominent position is what proves where Jesus was at when it came down to his society and to how they viewed each gender. OK. The ladies were the first to see the resurrection. They were the first to be told. They were the first to get it. And the first to spread it. Absolutely. So to use some, sorry, just, I've got to go a quiet angle, just so that some people say, oh, well, you know, sin came through E, through the women, yeah? Well, guess what? So did the life of knowing about Jesus. Counteract, all right? Moving on. <laughs> Hopefully that'll give me some, that give me some brownie points with joy at some point. Right.
Now I want us to look at the men. And again, I want us to imagine. But I don't want you to close your eyes. We're going to look at it from Peter's perspective. Remember, this is the day. Peter's perspective. Peter's perspective. He's dead. I saw it myself. He's the one who's meant to answer all prayers. Great miracles he did, yet he couldn't get himself off the cross. Oh, maybe I just imagined the last few years. Maybe it's all made up. Maybe he wasn't of God. Maybe I was expecting too much. But I was expecting God to save him. Well, seeing God didn't save him, he couldn't be from God, could he? Where was our Messiah? Where was my Messiah? I had followed him faithfully for three years. Yeah, I know I screwed up three nights ago and chickened out. But nonetheless, three years. Maybe I was right. Because look what happened. He died on the cross. Maybe I was right to chicken out. He's dead. Followed him, I did. He was the one to save us. He was going to be the answer to my prayers, to the prayers of Israel, to the prayers of Jerusalem. And I was telling everybody I know in my town who he was to be. How do I go back now, now that he's all dead and gone, how do I go back and face those I've been saying, this is the one to follow? How do I do it? They're going to go, so much for you then, bluster guts, eh? Where was this great Messiah who's going to chuck out the Romans? I'm too embarrassed. I don't know what to do. I thought he was going to save Israel. He was going to do it the way that we wanted him to do it. But he's dead. So much for Jesus. So much for Jesus. But I loved him. And he's dead. I loved him. And he's dead. So then the ladies rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. Andy's the name. You might better know me as Andrew. My wife calls me Andrew. I'm the brother of Pete. He's really cut up about Jesus. We all are. But he seems to have taken it the hardest. He's in great distress. I think he's angry between the fact that Jesus has not appeared to have been the answer to our prayers. And he's sad because he feels abandoned and lost. I don't know if you saw him earlier on. He just seems to be really between the two. And then to top it all, the women came in. Just now, I just told some fanciful story, something about going to the tomb, tomb empty, no body, two angels appear, tell him he's risen from the dead. They make up some load of baloney, these women, don't they? No wonder they're not reliable witnesses. <laughs> nonsense, absolute nonsense. Who want to listen to a woman anyway? Let's be honest. They're always after a crutch or something. They need something to lean on. That's why they so gullibly take things on board that says it's going to be all right. They need a crutch. Probably that's why they fill the synagogues or the churches so often, and not the men. And he's dead, and there's no coming back from that state, I can assure you. Isn't that right, Pete? Pete, Pete, where are you going? However, Peter jumped up, ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in, saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. I'll repeat that again. Peter jumped up, ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. Peter just went home. What did the ladies do? They went back and told. 
What does Peter do? Oh, he's empty. I'll go home. Wonder what's happened. Amazing, isn't it? Think about it just for a boat, second. Both male and female. Excuse me, ladies, don't sit there and think, <laughs> smugly, we got this. It's okay. This is 2,000 years on, all right? Men feel uncomfortable because we do not, we are terrible. But that's the way we're built. But Peter's just heard the most amazing story from, from the ladies. Ladies that he's been with for three years. Let's bear that in mind, okay? Who's got relationship with, formed with, been around with. Didn't believe them. And he's seen miracles. He's seen lives changed by Jesus. So why go, oh, empty tomb? So here's a question for you. Well, this is a question for you to think about, and then I'm going to ask a question that I want some answers to. Do you just go home after hearing a life-changing sermon or after hearing about Jesus Christ for the first time or the hundredth time and then do nothing about it? You just go home? Do you just go home after hearing a life-changing sermon or hearing about Jesus and then do nothing about it? Put nothing into action. Put nothing into place to go, I'm now going to make that part of my life. And this is the question I want an answer to. It's really hard. You ready? You've really got to listen to the question. Why? Why what? Why do you not put it into action? Why do you not make it change? Why? I remember the first time somebody told me the four spiritual laws. I was walking along the street evening. They had this display up against the supermarket wall. And one kid, another kid my age, who says, uh, "Have you ever heard the spiritual four spiritual laws?" And I uh, said, "No." So I sat down. He read them to me, and I got up. And I really, that was the first time I really, even though I grew up in a church, that was the first time I'd really heard the whole whole thing the gospel, and <laughs> I couldn't make any sense out of it. It, it was uh, almost a year later before, before I received Christ. In fact, it was a year later. But, and that, that was the first time. And that, that was, I, I, did, I did it because it just didn't make any sense to me. I couldn't work it out. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to come around. I've got Miriam, then I'll come to you, Leslie. Right. Um, I don't believe it. Um, it's irrelevant to my life. So what's the point of doing something about it? Thank you. I think it's worth just thinking back to that story. The bit that was missing for Peter was the angels to help him make sense of the story. The angels were there for the women and that is, they helped them make the sense of the story. And I think quite often for me, it's because if I, the reason I don't make a change is often because I can't make sense. It goes back to what Doug was saying. I can't quite make sense of it for me. I can ask you to push you because you're here. Who helps you then? So we all need an angel visitation to make sense of something? Or? Yeah. No, not necessarily an angel visitation, but um, friends, family, um, the Holy Spirit. It, you know, that, that making sense of it and it being a part of 
our lives and our story. Um, sometimes it is just what is spoken and that's sense enough. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it takes the intervention of other people or of God and or of God in another way. Thank you. I knew I could get away with pushing. Oh, I've got lots of hands up. Hang on. Where am I? Could you please, so I can see you clearly from here. I think before I gave my life to Christ, I think, I knew I should have done it a lot earlier, but I think I was thinking, I'm not perfect enough yet. Or I'm not ready. I'm not good, good, good enough yet. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think like how the women had the uh, visitation from the angel before I gave my life to Christ, people had told me the gospel. And it wasn't even that I couldn't make sense of it. I just didn't really mean anything. I had to have my own experience with the Holy Spirit to say, ah, oh, the revelation had to come in my heart, you know? And then I was ready to go and tell everyone, guess what, guess what? Like, Thank you. See, I think, I think the, the scripture there is very stark. It tends to suggest that he just looked and went away and thought, oh, well. But I don't think he did. And I, and I, don't, I don't think most people do. I think, I think for me, when I, when I first heard the gospel, I go away thinking, yeah, but what if? And what if? And what if I do? And what if I don't? And I'm kind of weighing all that stuff up so I'm not... I'm not jumping in with both feet because that's not that's not who I am. And it, it also and also in Peter's case, he's between a rock and a hard place anyway because he's he's thinking, well, if Jesus is dead, then I've just wasted three years. And if Jesus is alive, the last time I saw him, I said I didn't know who he was. So therefore, is he interested anyway? Thank you. So, I'm deliberately not going to comment. So let's carry on, shall we? There's something else that happened on that very, very same day. The last character for today. Come on, mate. We've got to go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, hi. Oh, sorry. Can't stop. Got to rush. Really got to get out of here. Got to get back to Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know it's night time. I know I'm aware of that. Thank you for pointing out. But, and I know we've got seven miles to go. Got that as well. But we've got to see our friends and tell them something. Gosh, we've got to get back. Yeah, we got, come on. We got, uh, all right. Stop nagging me. I'll tell you what it is before I go. Okay, bear with us. I'm clear, Pass. Hi, nice to meet you. This is, oh, never mind, it's not going to be recorded. It's a waste of time knowing. Anyway, this morning, we're on our way back home. We're going back to Jerusalem from here, from Emmaus. And quite frankly, we were miserable on our way back here to Emmaus. The last three days, and I really don't need to tell you, do I? I mean, everybody's heard about what's happened in Jerusalem in the last three days. Let's be honest, the gossip vine in our nation is more than slick enough. You know what's happened to the Rabbi Jesus. Anyway, we were really upset. We're walking our way back because of him dying on that cross where we thought he was going to be the Messiah. We were sort of following at a distance. You know, we weren't part of the original 12, but we really believed he was the one. He did great miracles. He was a fantastic teacher. He clearly appeared to be of God. But he was arrested, flogged, crucified. And so we thought we'd wait around for a few days, wait for the festival, you know, to part. But then it, we just thought, we've got to get back. And we were miserable. We were with the other disciples as well. And then to top it all, the women, they came in telling some tale about the Tomb opened, body gone. Apparently something to do with some blokes in brilliant, clo brilliant white clothing or something. And they reckon that he was alive or risen. Well, Peter rushed out, 
and he was couldn't understand why he'd rushed out. Well, what can I say? Well, we decided, me and um, no name here, we decided to uh, go back to Emmaus. We thought, what else is there to do? Let's get back home. On our way back, this bloke, fellow traveller, well, just, well, what can I say? We must have, he came up and asked us a question. He said, why is your conversation so intense? Because we must have been, me and no name here, we must have had a seriously intense conversation. And we must have been deep in conflag because didn't even see him approach. He was just suddenly there. Well, for a starter, I was quite surprised at the shock of his question because everybody knows what's happened over the last three days. Didn't understand what he didn't know had gone on in Jerusalem. Anyway, decided to explain to him everything that had happened. And then we got to the bit about the women's story coming in and telling that fantastical t story that made no sense whatsoever to any of us. And I thought he'll just sit there and agree with us. You know, he's a good bloke, we're a bloke, and they were women. But he called us foolish. Me, foolish, the cheek of us for not getting it, for not understanding. And I sat there and I thought, who do you think you are? But then he told the story from Moses, through the prophets, through the Psalms. And I sat there and I thought, hang on a minute, mate. I know this story better than probably most people. I hear it every year. I know the entire journey of our nation. I know about the Messiah. But I've got to say, as he started telling the story, something in my heart was burning. Same was happening in no name. Yeah, come on, hurry up. We've got to get going. I mean, it is pitch black. Let's go, let's go. But there was a part of me, in my heart, it was burning. Telling us how that the fact that the Messiah had to die had to die to win the war, had to die so that life could come. Heard it countless times. Anyway, besides him calling me foolish, I actually started to quite like the bloke. He seemed all right after a while. And then we got here to home to Emmaus. I mean, seven miles, it's a fair old trek, isn't it? We got home and the bloke looked like he was about to go on and carry on, but we begged him to stay. No, come and have to eat with us. Didn't we? As I said, I quite liked him after a while. Thought we might try and rebuke him a bit later on for calling this foolish, you know what I mean? For not agreeing with us that the women were a bit daft. But I'm really glad we did, because we sat and ate the meal in my house. He sort of took the bread. Well, I think I let him take the bread. I'm not quite sure, to be honest with you, because you know, in, my, in our day, I'm meant to t take the bread. I'm the head of the household. It's me that's down to break the bread over the meal. But he sort of took it, broke the bread. And as he broke the bread, I recognised it. I recognised that style of breaking bread for the first time ever. I saw Jesus do it when he fed the 5,000. And there it was. I couldn't believe it. My eyes were broken open. I saw it and I said, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Now, I don't know how we didn't recognise him in the first place. I've got to say, I don't know whether he was disguising himself, God was disguising him, or Satan was disguising him. Because Satan does like to block us out to the good things of Jesus, doesn't he? I don't know what happened. And I was just about to ask Jesus, how do we not recognise you? And he vanished. Just disappeared. So we're off to Jerusalem to go and tell the main 11. We're off to go and tell them. We've got to go and tell them that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Amen. Jesus is alive. Do us a favour. We're going. You tell everyone. Jesus is alive. You go tell everyone. You explain. You unpack the gospel. You unpack the gospel that Jesus is alive. That's our role. That's what the Resurrection Sunday means. Once you've known Jesus, what are you meant to go and do? In my teaching on 1 Corinthians, I've been talking about the power that Paul talks about is the convictional power of the Holy Spirit. When you talk to people about Jesus. And then the story continues.
And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord is really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost. Because ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Still they stood there in disbelief filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and raise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would, would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of these things. Who do you identify with? Are you with the women? You got it, you understand it, you're following Jesus. And quite frankly, that's not an easy term to phrase, because what does that look like? But we haven't got time to unpack that. I can tell you the basics. Believe, repent, and be baptised. Or are you the slow, dulled minded men who still need convincing? Just think about that just for a minute, please. Where are you at? Jesus said this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed are set free, and that this is the time of the Lord's favour. Where are you at? How much more convincing do you need? Do you need to be like Michael explained? You've heard it so many times, but you just know from Hebrews 11, you need to just have faith and leap out. Where are you at in your journey as a Christian? Have you lost the excitement and the wonder of knowing to tell people who Jesus is and what he's done for you? And then tell them what he's done for them. Are you willing to take the risks that the two disciples, clear pass and no name? Middle of the night, dangerous animal, wild animals, to run seven miles back to go and tell the exciting news. Now, I don't expect us wild animals, but actually to risk the danger of being alienated, the danger of being verbally attacked or physically attacked. To run that gauntlet, to run that danger of saying, but Jesus is worth telling everybody that he's alive. This is good news today. The resurrection story is amazing news, is it not? Sometimes there's some of us in our hearts, we know it up here, but it's somehow not always translated fully to our whole being. That we are forgiven. That death is not the end. It's true, actually. Whoever wrote that down, there are some Christians who don't want to go through death. But it's part of life. The concept of being forgiven is almost impossible for you to believe. 
You'll believe it up in your head, sort of say, yeah, for end times. But in daily things of your life today, am I forgiven? Oh, I won't forgive me for that little one. And then what is life? What does it really look like? I'm going to say no more. We're going to play a tune, which is just the instrumental to um, what we heard earlier on today. Who wants to live forever? And while that's being played, I want you to reflect with God. But what I want you to do is actually respond. Now, normally we, we, we allow for people just to respond where you're sat. But today that just does not feel like that. You need to be like the people to Emmaus. Don't care what anybody else thinks. Or be like the ladies in the, coming back from the tomb. Don't care that they're not going to be believed. Because they probably knew that the men would go, well, you're just the women. Stop worrying about what everybody else thinks. But Respond. If you feel whatever it is you want to stand and respond to to God, then do so, and then I will close in prayer. If something of the resurrection story, for the first time you think, you know, I've never been baptised. Oh, I talk about it loosely. I'm married to a Christian partner, that's enough. No, it's not. I will be blunt. You've got to get the personal excitement, just like everybody else. Maybe it's your time to stand and respond and say, yeah, I want to talk more about baptism. I actually just want to get baptized. Not talk about it anymore. I just want to be baptized. Come and see me or any of the leadership team. But we're going to play this now. And if you just want to respond, I don't need to know what you're responding to. Nobody else needs to know what you're responding to. More important, God does. Lord, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for choosing us to be here today. Whether we know you personally, or we don't. You chose us to be here today. Little insignificant us. Significant in your eyes. Lord, as we go out this afternoon, give us the excitement to tell people about you. Give us the excitement to remember what it means to know you. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.